Hey, why don't you stand in honor of God's Word, Psalm 122, um, and, and I'll read the text of Scripture together. I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built as a city that is compact together, where the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, to the testimony of Israel to give thanks to the name of the Lord, for thrones are set there for judgment, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. Peace be within your walls, prosperity within your palaces. For the sake of my brethren and companions, I will now say, peace be within you. Because of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. So reads God's Word. You may be seated. I have a message this morning entitled, Can't Wait for Sunday, Psalm 122. A few years back, a book came to market entitled, 90 Minutes in Heaven. It was a, 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 a supposedly a true story of life and death, in which the author, Don Piper, claims to have died in a car accident and gone to heaven where he spent 90 minutes walking the streets of gold and enjoying the glories of the throne of God. And then he came back to earth. My, the merits or demerits of the book aside, I love the response of one pastor who heard about this book, 90 Minutes in Heaven, and his response was this, big deal. I get that every Sunday and 93 minutes if the pastor runs long. <laughs> I like that answer. I love that perspective on Sunday worship. I get 90 minutes of heaven on earth, 93 if the sermon runs long, because that's true. Every Sunday when the church gathers in the Lord's house, and joins their hearts and voice with the church triumphant in heaven as the one family of God, and sets their affections on things above, you get a taste of heaven. On any given Sunday, when worship is ordered properly, and the people of God enter upon it enthusiastically as a company of people born from above, do you know what happens? Heaven comes down, and glory fills our souls. For the saints of God, on Sunday, they enter upon a special time. We, we agree with Pastor Paul Wolf. We get to enjoy 90 minutes of heaven, 93 if the sermon goes long. And with that perspective and passion in mind, I want to turn to Psalm 122 because it mirrors that passion. It mirrors that pleasure and perspective. Here we have a psalm of, the, of David where the meeting of God's people on the appointed day of worship is celebrated. I was glad when they said to me, let's go to the house of the Lord. Look, this is a special Sunday in the life of Kindred Community Church, and we're going to enjoy every moment of it. But I would remind you that last Sunday was special, and next Sunday will be special, because every Sunday is special when the church meets, and heaven comes down, and glory fills our souls. We love our new facilities, but we love them more for what they facilitate. They, they facilitate prayer and preaching and congregation and, and, and service and, and witness to this community. So let's come and, and remind ourselves that um, throughout the week, we, we, we need to have that spirit, I can't wait for Sunday. This Sunday, next Sunday, and every other Sunday. Now, let's put the text in its context. You'll see from the superscription that it is a psalm of King David. Some have tried to put this psalm into the post-exilic period, but I think it's a psalm of David. I think it was written before the temple was built. The Ark of the Covenant was now in Jerusalem. David had built the city of Jerusalem. It was compact. It was walled. It was fortified. And the people of God came up there uh, three times a year to worship God. 
as was um, prescribed in the festivals and feasts of, of uh, the covenants of God with the people of Israel. We know that David was a man who loved God's house. Psalm 27 verse 4 betrays his heart, right? I desire this one thing, and that's to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, that I may behold his beauty and inquire in his temple. Um, so the author is David. We're talking about the tabernacle, not the temple. It's a psalm of ascent. It was gathered up and collected and put in to a series of songs and hymns and psalms we call the Psalms of Ascent, which run from Psalm 120 to Psalm 134. And these were the songs that the pilgrims would sing on their way up to Jerusalem during the appointed feasts of Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. If you're going to go on a long journey, you may have a playlist you put together on your phone to play uh, through the media system within your car. This is Israel's playlist for the road trip to Jerusalem. And one of the songs is this one. It's the song of their arrival. When they get there, this is the song they're going to sing. I'm, I'm glad when they said to me, go to the house of the Lord, our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. This psalm of ascent is part of a trilogy of psalms in the Psalms of Ascent. Psalm 120, 121, and Psalm 122 belong together. In Psalm 120, the psalmist bewails the brokenness of the world and the fact that even as he journeys up to Jerusalem, he is surrounded by enemies. In Psalm 121, given the danger he's in, he prays that the Lord would keep his feet in his going out and his coming in, that the Lord would help him and preserve him and protect him. And even in Psalm 122, when he gets to the city, when his feet stand within the city, he just rejoices and celebrates his arrival. You'll notice the connection between the end of Psalm 121 and Psalm 122. Look at where Psalm 121 ends. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. Talking about going out and coming in, I was glad when they said to me, let's go to the house of the Lord. Three things if you're keep keeping notes. You'll notice his pleasure, verses 1 to 2. He just celebrates the joy of worshiping with the people of God at an appointed time of worship within the house of God. Then you've got the, his praise. As he looks around Jerusalem, as he senses the moment he's in, he, 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 he celebrates um, the fact that it's, it's a city compact together. It's, it's a city where the tribes of God go up and give testimony to God within Israel. It's a, it's a place where thanks to God is rendered. It's a place where justice is served. And um, then he, his prayer, given the central importance of this city, he prays for its peace and he prays for its prosperity. Now, here's the thing to bear in mind as we work through this outline and this ancient psalm. We're going to update it in terms of its application. We'll preach it. We'll understand it as it relates to David and the Jewish kingdom and the nation of Israel and the tabernacle within the city of Jerusalem with all of the sacrifices and priesthood that would go with that. But we're going to update it this by reminding ourselves we are now under the new covenant. We're in the dispensation of the church. And these things have now been fulfilled in an amplified manner in Christ, who is our Passover, in Christ, who is our great high priest, in Christ, who made a sacrifice uh, uh, for sin by himself once and for all. We're not saved by the blood of bulls and goats, but the blood of the precious Lamb of God as without spot. And then we're going to remind ourselves, and in this day, in this dispensation, God's focused not on a physical temple in Jerusalem, but in the church. The church has become the temple gathered, and, and your body has become a place of God's dwelling on the earth. And so along the way, we'll make application to the church under Christ. 
First of all, his pleasure. The psalmist begins with the delight of, of, of all pilgrims in, ex, in being invited to make the journey to Jerusalem during a festival and the sheer joy that comes upon arrival. I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. He, he relishes the event and he relishes the experience. There's a feeling of ecstasy, ecstasy, as he enters Jerusalem, the place of God's enthroned presence, where the house of God is to be found, where the meeting place between heaven and earth exists. Remember the movie Rudy? Even if you're not a Notre Dame fan, you got to love the movie. I do. I've watched it several times. I still always kind of get a little bit of goosebumps on that scene when, you know, Rudy Rudiker has eventually made his way onto the team. No one believed he could do it. Not even his father. Not even his brother. But there comes that moment when he tells him he's going to shirt for, for, the, for the game. And, and there's an outside chance maybe, maybe he'll get the play, which he does for like one moment. And um, he gets his one play. But there's, this, there's, there's a scene when the whole family gets off the bus and his father, a steel worker, Notre Dame fan who's never been to South Bend, comes through the stadium stairs and, and all of a sudden the stadium opens up and there comes that moment. He said, this is the most beautiful thing these eyes have ever seen. You know, that's when men weep, girls. But, but, but there comes a point, and David's kind of, this is the moment he's living, along with the pilgrims, they, they're seeing the beauty of the city of Jerusalem and the dwelling place of God. These, this is the most beautiful thing these eyes have ever seen. I want to spend my days here in the house of the Lord. I want to look into God, God's face and see the beauty of his character and his works, and I want to inquire in his temple. That's his pleasure. Now, now what's, what's the application? Well, it's to us. We've, we've got to translate that wonder, that joy, that ecstasy, that astonishment into our pursuit of the Lord Jesus, into our praise of the head of the church. We've got to express an amplified joy. David's joy was real. But, but David's living in the shadows of what is fully promised and fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And now you and I are living under the new covenant where all that the tabernacle and temple symbolized has now come to fulfillment in the one who was made flesh and tabernacled among us. And now he indwells us by the Holy Spirit, and we are a temple of the living God. And the church, fitted together, is a habitation of the Spirit, Ephesians 2. We are living in unbelievable days. Where is the glory of God? It's in you. And if that's true, if you're redeemed and saved and forgiven and indwelt by the Spirit of God, you belong to God, it's grounds for celebration. That's what the application is. You and I ought to treasure the church as the temple of God that meets on an appointed day, the first day of the week, on a Sunday, the day that Jesus rose again, and we come together to pray and fellowship, break bread, and hear the apostles' doctrine. And you know what? Monday, you can't wait for Sunday. Tuesday, you can't wait for Sunday. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, you can't wait for Sunday. Saturday, you're beside yourself because you're going to be at church tomorrow. You're glad when your pastor reminds you to be at church next week. 
and you jump out of bed on a Sunday morning when your parents tell you it's time to go to church. Or maybe you haven't been for a while and some brother calls you up, hey, we need to see you at church on Sunday. I was glad when they said to me, let's go up to the house of the Lord. I love what one writer says. James Hamilton Jr. teaches at Southern Baptist Seminary. He's speaking on this psalm. He says, the psalmist's gladness resonates with the people of God across space and time. We love to worship the Lord in the presence of His people. We love to see the fruits of His redeeming love in the radiant faces of those who know His merciful kindness. And then he has this statement, nowhere can a better God be encountered. Nowhere can a truer message be heard. Nowhere can a more authentic people be known. And nowhere can can a greater cause be attempted than in church? Are you excited about church? I hope so. You, you see his pleasure? Let me, let me run in a, in a, in a direction for, for a couple of minutes here. Uh, uh, David tells us elsewhere in Psalm 69 verse 9 that the zeal of your house has consumed me, eaten me up. Are you excited about the meetings of the church? Now, now some become more significant in your life than others. But the church is to gather. The church is the ecclesia, the called out ones, that on a given weekend and throughout the week in different small groups, they gather to pray, fellowship, break bread, hear the word. And we love that. We're excited about the meetings of the church. Hebrews 10, 24 to 25, do not forsake the assembling of yourself together. When, when you see us advertise a breakfast, a small group, a women's study, a book study, a children's meeting, a training session, a core class, all of that stuff excites you because it's just another opportunity to be with God's people, hearing God's Word and growing in the knowledge of God. Uh, our, our, our Savior. We must meet together in here if we're to survive out there. Number two, are you excited about the members of the church? I know it can be challenging to dwell above with saints we love. That will be glory to dwell below with saints we know. Different story. <laughs> it can be challenging. We are God's peculiar people. I get it. Some of us have some rough edges and growing to do, but I want to tell you, I can say this. As, a, as someone who grew up in the church, didn't become a believer until I was 16, there's nobody like the people of God. Amen. There's no family beats it. Amen. Back to his quote. 1 Timothy 3 verse 15 talks about the, the house of God, how to behave in the house of God. But really, it's a Greek word that means household the family of God. That's what we are. Look around you. We're family. You've got to own that image. We are family. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. And you know what you do with family? You love them. Do you know what you do with family? When someone's upset in the family, you work through the problems. You don't run. You know what you do in a family? You accept each other. You're patient, you're loving. You know what you do in a family? You make a priority of it. You spend time together, and you certainly set out to help each other in good and bad times. That's what families do. Buildings are not the church. People are the church. Remember, this is a beautiful facility. We, we rejoice in what God has given us, but we only love the facility for what it facilitates the gathering of the church. I like the story that Warren Wearsby tells of a little girl who was sitting on top of a pile of luggage in a hotel lobby, and her parents were at the desk registering for a room, and a sympathetic lady asked the little girl why they were visiting the city. Were they here to see relatives? To which the little girl replied, oh no, we're going to live at this hotel until we find a house. My dad got a new job, and we're relocating we had to sell our house and, and move. And to which the, the lady said, oh, it's, it's too bad you don't have a home. To which the little girl replied, oh, we do have a home. We just look in a house to put it in. <laughs> it's 
kind of analogy. We, we've, this is a house. God has put us in it. It's great. But we have a family. This is just a house. The building's not the church. The people are the church. And you'll love this place just like I love my home in the city of Orange. I love driving to it. I love being in it. I feel bad when I'm not there because it's our home. It's where our family is. It's where love is to be found. Are you excited about the meetings of the church, the members of the church? Are you excited about the ministers of the church? Christ has gifted his church with pastor teachers and the church ought to receive them as such a gift from the head of the church, Ephesians 2, 4, 11 to 12. Listen, a church well led and a church well fed is a blessed congregation. And I'd like to believe with all of our faults and failures, because we are weak and sinful men, we trust are holy enough for God to use, that you feel well led and well fed. And then if that's the case, you're blessed. And that should excite you about being here because you've got leaders you can trust, leaders you submit to, provide for, esteem for their work sake, and you allow them to do their ministry with joy. Hebrews 13, 7, verse 17 it's been well said that it's the pastor's job to feed and lead, and it's the church's job to follow and swallow. I hope you're excited about that equation, because we're here to equip you. We're here to serve you, and then we're here to make you servants. Are you excited about the mission of the church? We have a mission. We have a purpose. We're here for a clear purpose, and that is to have global impact, to, to reach out into the world, to make disciples of our neighbors and workmates, those we play sports with, those that cross our paths. Matthew 28, 19 to 20. It's an exciting mission. We, we exist to, to make and mature and mobilize disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Is there anything more exciting than that? Uh, if I was a doctor, I'd be excited to be a doctor because I get to help people and heal bodies and, and, and bring a sense of hope. If I was a teacher in a classroom of kids, I'd be excited to be a teacher because I get the joy of teaching them and, and training them and opening them up to a world of knowledge. We could go on making the analogies, but, but how more excited should we be where we get to bring healing to the soul, where we get to introduce people to the eternal truths and verities of God as revealed in His Word? There's no greater knowledge than the knowledge of God, and there's no greater health than soul salvation. What an exciting mission you and I are part of. You know, some years ago, uh, through the kindness of some friends, June and I spent a week in Martha's Vineyard in a little town called Agerstown. It's where Jaws was filmed. In fact, every Tuesday night, you can go downtown and watch Jaws in the local cinema. <laughs> Not that we did. Um, but anyway, uh, uh, we had a little bit of a routine in the mornings. Uh, June got to sleep in, and I got to waking up, and, uh, and, and typically I'd, I'd spend a bit of time reading and then run down to a, a, a coffee shop for, for June's kind of regimented breakfast, a cup of coffee and a blueberry scone. And, and, and on the way down to this little shop called Expresso Love, um, you'd, you'd come by this old church, beautiful church, white pillars, red brick, it was the old Wheeling Church in Agerstown. It was a stately landmark. It was built in 1843. And no doubt in its, its original days, it was built to, to, to help rescue the perishing and care for the dying. Can you imagine wheelers and seamen sitting on its pews with their families on the Lord's Day asking for God's protection against the peril of a watery grave? But today, it's a civic center. Today, it's a place for weddings, concerts, and, and ground uh, school graduations. In fact, we're told 
I looked it up on the, on, the, on the local website. It's one of the finest examples of Greek revival architecture in New England. Boo-hoo. <laughs> Boo-hoo. Because it's a church where the people of God are meant to meet, and the Word of God is to be preached, and the praises of God are to be sung, but not anymore. Somewhere along the line, that church and its leaders forgot their mission. And that which set out to be a place that cared for the dying and rescued the perishing is now a civic center. The seats are empty and the building is silent. And on a Sunday morning, People go by it as they duck into espresso love for a cup of coffee. Let that be a warning to us in any church. <laughs> Are you excited about the master of the church? Jesus is the head of the church. It's Lord and Master, Ephesians 5, 23. It's His church. And we want to do church His way. Over time, we can become possessive about our church and its ministries, but let's serve His glory. Let's be flexible for His glory. Let's change where change is necessary for His glory. If the church at Laodicea teaches us anything, it teaches us the possibility of locking Jesus out of His church where he's standing on the outside knocking to get in. May that never be the case at Kindred Community Church because we're a body of leaders and we're a company of saints who want him to have the preeminence in all things. Let's move on and speed up. His praise, his pleasure, glad, to be in God's house, feet standing in the city of Jerusalem. But look at his praise. Now he extols the city he stands in. He, he drinks in the atmosphere. He, he takes the, the, the pulse of what is going on, and there are several things that jump out. He, he loves this city, and he loves to talk about this city. And there's three things he, he talks about, and it's compact. And it's the place where the tribes of God go up. And the praises of God are sung and thanksgivings are uttered. And it's a place where justice is served. If I might put it in an outline form, he, he, he praises what's going on in this place. It's a city marked by togetherness. It's a city marked by thankfulness. And it's a city marked by truthfulness. I want to concentrated in the middle one, given the nature of today. We have a lot to be thankful for. But let's just work through this quickly. It's a city marked by togetherness. Look at verse 3. Jerusalem is built as a city that is compact together. I think that's another argument for a Davidic authorship, because it was, it was more sprawling as time went by. But under David, it was compact. It was small. It was dense. Houses were stacked on top of each other. Streets were narrow. But, 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 but architecture says something. And I think the architecture of this city was a spiritual metaphor for the fact that just as the city is tight and, 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 and there's, a, there's a togetherness about it, a, a closeness about it, so when the people of God go up and worship there, they go up together. The desperate tribes of Israel from the coast, from the plains, from the highlands. They all come up with their different backgrounds and edges, but now they're one unit. They're, they're, they're a tightly knit family of tribes who are there to worship God as He has appointed at Passover and Tabernacles and, and Pentecost. I love that. It's a city marked by togetherness. The city was the unifying center of the nation. And, and if you and I were to make any kind of application, uh, I love the language of Ephesians 2. 
as Paul describes the church. And he, and he, he does describe it as a building, almost like David describes Jerusalem as a city compact together where the tribes come up and unite in worship. Paul wants to, us to remember whether we're Jew or Gentile, whether we're rich or poor, whether we're male or female. Here's how he describes us. Here is how he describes the church as a, a building being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. God has brought you here to fit in to be a unifying force, to bring your gifts, your love, your money, your time to help build this church around a united effort to live for God's glory and spread His Word. Let's therefore endeavor to keep that unity in the spirit of peace. Paul Powell says this, very simple but very effective. Soldiers together make an army. Trees together make a forest. Shingles together make a roof. Bricks make a wall. Drops of water make a river. Links make a chain. Flowers make a bouquet. And players make a team. A snowflake is not much. But when enough of them cooperate, it'll shut down your city. Togetherness is the benchmark of any successful organization, team, club, or church. I want to tell you, if you and I will band together, meet regularly, give generously, serve enthusiastically with one heart and one spirit, we'll be unstoppable. And we'll be a force to reckon with in this community. I love Psalm 133. It's a good and a pleasant thing when brothers dwell together in unity, for it is there that God commands His blessing. The city marked by thankfulness. The city marked by thankfulness. You'll notice verse 4. The purpose of the tribes of Israel going up to Jerusalem to the Ark of the Covenant was to give thanks to God for His presence among the people for a means by which their sins could be forgiven or covered in the sacrifices that went on around the mercy seat through the high priest to thank God for His covenant promises to that people. They had grounds for gladness, and along the road to Jerusalem, they reminded themselves of the mile markers of God's goodness and mercy. And they entered His courts with thanksgiving and His gates with praise. Psalm 100 verses 1 and 2, 4 and 5. Now, let's apply it to the church. And Christ, the head of that church, our great high priest, isn't it God's will that we be a thankful congregation? 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 18, this is the will of God for you. You want to be clear about what you ought to be doing as a Christian? Here's, here's one aspect of it. Clear as day. This is the will of God for you. Give thanks in everything. I'm going to run through this quickly, but why don't you write down the word thanks in an acrostic form and then put some ideas beside them. Let's take the letter T. Why don't you thank God for things? 1 Timothy 6 verse 17, God has given us all things to enjoy. They're not the most important thing about life. Things are not the most important thing about life. All your stuff is not that important. Life doesn't consist in the things that you possess. You might have a nice set of golf clubs. You might have a nice little boat. You might have a few things around the house that are nice, and nothing wrong with that. Not the most important thing about your life. At the same time, you ought to give thanks for them. God has given us all things to enjoy. And Americans have a lot of things. The average American garage looked like, looks like Aladdin's cave just full of stuff. Use it or give it away. That's my, uh, that's my word to you this morning. But, but be thankful for things. Be thankful each for health. I mean, getting here, there might have been some squeaks and unusual noises along the way. 
Some parts of your body may not be working as well as they u- it used to, but that's fine. If you're in your clothes and in your right mind and you have a measure of health and strength, that's great grounds for thanks <laughs> that the Lord has healed your diseases and, and redeemed your life from destruction and renewed your youth like the eagle. Psalm 103, verses 3 to 5. We need to be on our knees and thanks for the fact we're on our feet at all. Number three, adversity. Romans 5, 3 to 4. Paul tells us in that passage to rejoice in tribulation. What do you mean, Paul, rejoice in tribulation? Well, because trouble and trial and hardship in tough times, they, they, they become sandpaper in the hand of God to rub off the rough edges of our character, to humble us, make us more dependent, where we get to see God's grace is sufficient in all sets of circumstances. Sometimes our adversity weans us off this world and reminds us that the things that last are not physical or material. Travel broadens us but trouble deepens us. And now, there's no time like the present. I hope you realize that. Psalm 118, 24, this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. The reason so many people find it hard to be happy is that they view the past as better than it was and the future better than it will be. Today is all we need, all we can handle, and all we got. So make sure you're living this moment. K, kindness, Philippians 4, 10 to 16, the care of others for us is an extreme blessing. Do you have someone, do you have people in your life, I would say it's multiple, wouldn't you, who care for you? Now sadly, sometimes in our prodigalism and in our rebellion, we don't appreciate their care, but it's a wonderful thing to have people in your life who will pursue you out of love, rebuke you out of kindness, and care for you in difficult times. If you've got loving parents, you've got faithful pastors, you've got good friends, my friend, you're blessed. And you ought to be glad when they say to you, let's get up to the house of the Lord, because when I'm up there, I'm going to thank them for things, health, adversity, now, kindness, Paul wrote his letter to the Philippians to thank them that their care for him had flourished once again. Remember when we looked at that, that word flourish is an agricultural, horticultural term. It means a a tree that's blossoming with new leaves or a flower that's opening up. And Paul's saying, hey, I'm over here in Rome under house arrest. It's kind of winter time, metaphorically speaking. It's tough time, dark times. But you brought a little bit of spring to my winter. If you get someone in your life or someone's in your life that brings spring and winter, it's a wonderful thing. And then S, salvation. It's last on our list, but it should be first on the list. Some, uh, Colossians 1, 12 to 13. You know, where he thanks God that he has taken him out of the kingdom of darkness and transferred him into the kingdom of God's dear Son. There's no greater health than the soundness of your soul. You can't see anything better this morning than it is well with my soul. (laughs) It's a good thing to give thanks to the Lord in all of these things. I think I've told you before about Robert G. Or Robert G. Lee, who was the pastor at Bellevue Baptist Church before Adrian Rogers, very famous Southern Baptist pastor and preacher. And one day he was kind of accosted by a disgruntled church member who, who complained that he was away too much, gone out of the pulpit and preaching elsewhere, to which he replied, well, look at it this way. If the substitute preacher preaches better than I do, you'll be thankful I'm gone. But if the substitute preacher is worse than I am, you'll be thankful I'm back. (laughs) Either way, you'll be thankful. I want to tell you, my friend, on any given day, whatever we're facing, either way, we've got great grounds for thankfulness. Don't have time to develop the the third mark, the city marked by truthfulness. That would be verse 5, for the thrones are set there for judgment, the thrones of of the house of, of David. 
Thrones are a symbol of the rule of law and the administration of justice. Jerusalem is the seat of justice, Jeremiah 21, 11 to 12. In fact, the thrones of David would be a reference, I think, of the fulfillment of 2 Samuel 7, 16, the perpetuity of the Davidic throne, ultimately in Jesus Christ. But there will be a succession of kings who will bring justice. Now, the word justice or judgment here means the decisive word by which God straightens things out and put things right. Justice is the application of the judgments of God. Justice is the application of the law of God revealed in the Word of God. And any good king in the house of David will bring justice by applying God's Word to a situation where the Word of God in all of its sufficiency and authority arbitrates regarding the matters of life. And, and, and the David here rejoices that in Jerusalem, you'll find the Word of God applied to life, where the Word of God makes judgments on the judgments that must be made. Simple application. Deserves more, but we've got to get to the last thought. It's a wonderful thing to come to the house of God and be met by the judgments of God, the application of His law the declaration of His Word in all matters of faith and practice. One of the best definitions I've ever come across regarding preaching or the dissemination of Scripture is by the Puritan preacher Cotton Mather, who said that the great purpose of preaching is to, quote, restore the throne and dominion of God in the souls of man. Love that. This is a world in rebellion. And God's throne and rule is reestablished as the Word of God is preached and people submit to its authority and its judgments. Preaching is the restoration of the throne and judgment of God. I pray that every succeeding Sunday in this new facility that you and I will not stand in judgment over the Word of God, but come like the Bereans ready to hear and to sit under the Word of God and be judged by it. Let the Word of God judge your behavior this past week, calling you to repentance and reformation. Let the Word of God judge the matters that lie before you this week. Let's get to the final thought. We can be quick. The prayer, verses 6, 7, 8, and 9. The pleasure, the praise, the prayer. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. Peace within your walls. Prosperity within your palaces. For the sake of my brethren and companions, I will now say peace within you. Because of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. The psalmist now issues a call to prayer for the peace and protection of the city and citizens of Jerusalem. He, he calls for an army of intercessors to pray down God's benediction upon the work of God and the worship of God within that city. And then he himself prays in a self-same manner that peace will visit his family and friends and all who travel to Jerusalem. And then he widens his prayer to take in the good and welfare of every worshiper in Jerusalem within the house of God. Point as we close. May, may we remember that God's house is a house of prayer. Jesus taught us that. And in public settings and in small groups and in one-on-one -on -one discipleship, may prayer be part of all that we do. May we intercede for one another. May we be an army of intercessors praying down God's prosperity and peace upon our ministry. In, in, in practical terms, I think we pray for Jerusalem today, don't we? That'd be hard not to take that as an inference from, from, from the text. While we're in the dispensation of the church, I would argue that the city of Jerusalem is still strategic, and, 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 and the future will show that it's got a central role in the plan of God. Jesus returns to the city of Jerusalem. Throughout the tribulation, the, the city of Jerusalem is a cup of trembling. Jesus will set up His kingdom in that city. It's a strategic city, uh, both in the past, in the present, and in the age to come.
And yet we're aware as Christians reading prophetic scripture as we just did over the past few months that real peace will not come to Jerusalem or the Middle East until the Prince of Peace comes. So we pray for Jerusalem today and we pray for the Middle East by extension. But we pray that people will become aware of the hour we're in and the spiritual conflict that's unfolding that they will bow the knee to the one to whom everyone will bow a knee, the Lord Jesus Christ, who alone brings peace to the human heart and alone will bring peace within history. And we ought to pray for our own nation and our capital city, Washington, D.C. 1 Timothy 2, 1 to 2 tells us to pray for those in power and authority that you and I might live quiet and peaceable lives and the Word of God may not be bound or hindered. I think we're all anxious about where our nation's at, where our nation's going, what might come on the other side of this election. But I would say this, and I was reminded of this in, in my study this week, I pass it on to you. The best thing you and I can give to this nation right now is a bowed head, an abandoned knee, and a broken heart as we go to God and pray for righteous leaders, courageous pastors, strong law enforcement, which is the role of government, healthy families made up of husbands and wives raising responsible citizens and bringing them up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. We should, we should mourn fatherless children. We should mourn abortion and sexual perversity. We should pray for respect for authority. We should pray for a work ethic among our people. There are seven million young men in America this morning who have no desire to work. We pray for good education opportunities, for love of country and national unity. Pray for neighborliness, the sick, the needy, the hurting. Pray for justice in our courts. Pray for protection against our enemies. Pray that truth will prevail. Pray for revival and evangelism. More could be said, we're done. I was glad when they said to me, let's get up to the house of the Lord. Amen. As I look back on my Christian life and this psalm stirred up many memories of sitting as a young boy, unregenerate, in Sunday worship with my mom and dad because they made a covenant with God to bring their children to the Lord's house every Lord's day. As I look back and see my coming to faith and, and beginning to love what I once hated, I began to appreciate that little church with all of its faults and weaknesses. I've looked back in my life and I've come to this conclusion, as I've kept Sunday, Sunday has kept me. I think God promises to bless those who sanctify the Sabbath, so to speak, and those who don't forsake the assembling of the saints together. I want to tell you something. I think the psalmist is hinting at this. You keep Sunday, and Sunday will keep you. It'll keep you in love with Jesus. It'll keep you from sinning easily. It'll keep you from the world and your heart growing materialistic and temporal in focus. It will keep you in the love of God and in the mercy of the Lord Jesus, and it will keep you with an eye on your neighbor and a desire to love your neighbor as God has loved you. Lord, we thank you for Psalm 122. It seems an appropriate psalm as we celebrate this Lord's day and our new house of worship. But Lord, we, as we stand our feet within these walls, we, we're glad and excited about what you're doing here and our part in it. We pray that this ministry would be marked by togetherness and truthfulness and thankfulness. We pray that this would be a house of prayer. We pray that it would be filled by people who are eaten up and consumed with a zeal for the house of God and the furtherance of the church. Lord, it is true. Time has proven it, and the saints of God can testify to it. If we keep Sunday, 
Sunday will keep us. And so, Lord, help us whatever day of the week to cultivate a spirit that says, I can't wait for Sunday. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.